When I wrote my essay on workplace bullying, I explicitly stated that if we are ever to have any hope of doing anything about the problem, that problem must be defined first. And that is the problem. We still don't have a universally acknowledged and accepted definition of what exactly workplace bullying is. The reason no one ever does anything about workplace bullying is that no one, including the weak leaders who pay lip service against it, knows what workplace bullying really is. Ask people who do not know anything about workplace bullying to define workplace bullying and the answer you are going to get is going to sound a lot like childhood bullying. The reason there are laws against childhood bullying is that it is so easy to define. Physical violence, kicking, punching, hitting, shoving, and pinching, and verbal abuse, yelling, screaming, shouting, insults, and name calling, you're fat, you're stupid, etc. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Workplace bullying is different from childhood bullying in both manner and intent. For most people who don't know anything about workplace bullying, the term workplace bullying immediately conjures up the stereotypical image of an angry, aggressive, abusive boss, usually a large white male, calling his quivering codependent subordinate, usually a younger female, on the carpet in front of him and proceeding to verbally berate her. That is a dangerous trope that is a grotesque disservice to all of the victims of workplace bullying whose experience does not fit into that narrow definition. Workplace bullying is rarely that overt. Workplace bullies are narcissists and narcissists care about one thing and only one thing in this world or in this life and that's their image, their reputation, what other people think of them and how they look to other people. They may have absolutely zero spiritual awareness, otherwise known as wisdom, but they are not stupid. They will never do or say anything that will get them into trouble, get them fired, or worse, get them arrested. The whole point of workplace bullying is that it has to be as passive aggressive as possible so that the workplace bullies can never be called on their behavior and it can never get back to them. Workplace bullying is a series of an accumulation of microaggressions designed and intended to make the target so miserable and uncomfortable that he or she voluntarily quits so that workplace bullies can turn around and blame you for your own separation from work because narcissists always have to victim blame shift and because workplace bullies as narcissists really don't want the paper trail associated with an outright firing. More practically speaking, they just don't want a wrongful termination lawsuit, which is a paranoid, irrational fear in a state with at-will employment, which is almost all states. I have long argued that all workplace bullying is actually spiritual warfare happening on an energetic level, and everything is energy and intent. But the intent argument doesn't work because how do you prove it? Workplace bullies can always lie about their intent because all narcissists are always pathological liars and a lot of workplace bullying behaviors can be interpreted subjectively. At some point, workplace bullying must be defined by the individual behaviors, the actions and the words. So that's what I did. Because I have over three decades of experience of being bullied in the workplace, I compiled a list of 20 behaviors that I call techniques that workplace bullies use to bully you. I have written about these techniques along with specific examples in my essay on workplace bullying and I have made individual videos about each one, but I get the feeling that you don't read my essay and you don't watch my videos and I don't blame you. So what I did is without getting into the why of the behaviors and without too many specific examples, I compiled all 20 workplace bullying techniques into one video so that we can finally have a clear description of what workplace bullying is and what it isn't. So let's do this. Let's get into it. Get your tea, get your snacks, make a Moscow mule or three. You might want to sit down for this one.
In my experience, workplace bullying almost always starts with the mind games. You know how it goes. By now, you know the drill. The workplace bully has a prepared speech for you. It's about a friend, someone, or somebody, these people, or some other indeterminate group of people, or just themselves. You are supposed to intuitively understand that the workplace bully is not talking about another person or himself, but is really talking about you, sending you a message, and usually insulting you. So for example, let's say the workplace bully wants to call you fat and stupid, so he's going to tell a little story about a friend who is fat and stupid, someone or somebody who's fat and stupid, these people who are all just so fat and stupid or just I'm so fat, I'm so stupid, etc. I like to use my brown shoes example. If you are wearing brown shoes, I can say I have a friend who's wearing brown shoes and I just think she's so stupid. It's like if I said I have a friend who's watching my video on my YouTube channel right now, and I just think she's so stupid. We all know that friend does not exist. The workplace bully is really talking about you. I once had a narcissistic sexual partner who was from Germany, and he was always playing mind games with me about what he called the Americans with this over-articulated the, like Megan the Stallion, Houston native. And because his English was so bad, he didn't know that you don't use the definite article when you make generalizations about people. Anyway, he would sort of follow me around like that with this running commentary about the Americans and how we're all so stupid because we use antibiotics or antibacterial air freshener in the bathroom or too many napkins when we go out to eat or we don't change lanes often enough on the freeway or whatever petty nonsense he could come up with. I was supposed to get that he was really talking about me and he had me trained like a Pavlovian dog. Whenever he started his rants about the Americans, I knew the insults were coming, the insults were coming. Physical violence in the workplace does not happen. If workplace bullies have actually assaulted you, I'm very sorry, but that has not been my experience. I was assaulted by a former coworker outside the workplace, but I classify that under the workplace bullying technique of stalking. All the same, Workplace bullies very much want to get physically violent with you and some of them have rape fantasies. Instead of getting physically violent with you, workplace bullies threaten physical violence. Instead of getting physically violent with you, workplace bullies get violent with the workplace. They're loud. There's a lot of slamming of doors, cabinets, and drawers slamming the phone down, banging on furniture, equipment and supplies like books, loud throat clearing and other bodily noises like singing, whistling, humming, and of course, stomping. We've all had to work with the workplace stomper who likes to stomp past your workspace and simultaneously beam the hate, death, glare down on you. Other workplace bullies may get physically violent with you indirectly by pushing things like doors and equipment against your body. I find that the workplace bullying technique that I call physical violence primarily takes one of two forms inappropriate touching and space invasion. Inappropriate touching is exactly as it sounds in professions like medicine, dance, massage therapy, aesthetics, and maybe a handful of others. Physical touch is part of the job. It's kind of inevitable. 
I argue that if you're not doing hair or nails, you have no business touching your coworkers. Physical touch has no place in intellectual white collar professions like law, education, engineering, or accounting, and yet workplace bullies touch their targets all the time. I have been touched on almost every single inch of my physical body except for the most sexual parts of my body but i find that inappropriate touching in the workplace primarily takes two forms you have the shoulder clamp and the one arm side hug when workplace bullies are not touching your body they like to touch and move your things especially your food and workplace bullies violate your physical boundaries by invading your personal space. Workplace bullies like to get all up in your face, sit or stand way too closely to you and enter your workspace, which is not big enough to accommodate more than one person. A niche of the workplace bullying technique of physical violence is my personal favorite workplace bullying technique, a little something I like to call crotch busting. I have a soft spot in my heart for the workplace crotch busters. Crotch busting works best in an office setting. The workplace bully approaches you when you are seated at your desk, stands or sits on the edge of your desk, spreads his legs, and is that a dick or what? the workplace bully's rock star hard on is pointed all up in your grill and you're supposed to be intimidated that this guy has such a big dick it's like wow you can't even close your legs because your dick is so big i'm so intimidated with one guy who shoved his junk in my face, I had to wonder if he had padded his underwear because he was not given BDE. Do men actually do that? Some workplace bullies may not have the best hygiene in the whole entire world and they may just be going commando up under there because they don't do laundry because they're too lazy or can't afford to. It's like these very thin dress pants and you can very clearly make out the outline of the whole eggplant emoji package with one dude that I worked with. It was like, oh, ding dong, senor, hashtag impressive. You're packing a can of air freshener, big boy. I get it. The contemporary term for this is man spreading, but I didn't know that when I wrote my essay on workplace bullying and women do this too. The female workplace bully just parks it on your desk, opens her legs and shoves her lady bits in your face. Yelling is another one of those workplace bullying behaviors that people who don't really know anything about workplace bullying automatically associate with workplace bullying and that's because yelling is something that everyone associates with abuse. But like physical violence, yelling in the workplace is something that doesn't really happen. I have heard stories from other targets of workplace bullying about overt aggressions like shouting. I'm very sorry that was their experience, but that has not really been mine. I have physically worked inside about 80 workplaces and I heard actual shouting only once and for once it was not directed at me. It was in a company that was so small, it had probably fewer than 10 employees and no HR department and every single person in it was a raging high level narc so these people got away with murder, probably literally. Instead of yelling what workplace bullies do, is something more along the lines of voice raising. Workplace bullies know how to ratchet the volume of their voices up to just the last decibel before actual yelling. I have heard plenty of voice raising in my 30 plus year career. I find that voice raising in the workplace primarily occurs in two instances, either directly at you or to another person in your vicinity about you. Insults, put downs, and name calling are 
yet another one of those workplace bullying behaviors that people who don't really know anything about workplace bullying automatically associate with workplace bullying and that's because again insults are something that everyone associates with abuse yes workplace bullies do insult their targets all the time but again the abuse is simply not that overt I have heard stories from targets of workplace bullying who have been called names directly to their face. Again, I'm so sorry that that was their experience, but that has not really been mine. I can count only really a handful of times that people have called me names directly to my face. The most common insult in the workplace appears to be stupid. Most of the time, workplace bullies insult you passive aggressively using the workplace bullying technique of mind games so i vote that we just fold insults into mind games and call it a day workplace bullies also like to give compl assaults insults disguised as compliments accompanied by an insulting tone and or facial expression like your bag but the workplace bully really doesn't or i like your skin it looks Another way in which workplace bullies insult you is with the workplace bullying technique that I call muttering under the breath. I did not know this was a thing until about 10 years ago. Workplace bullies mouth insults in your face that are inaudible to you but somehow audible to everyone around you and everyone erupts an explosive laughter. You can't understand what was said and that's the point. When push comes to shove, workplace bullies simply insult you in a foreign language, assuming that you can't understand or that they can get away with it because it's not the dominant language in the culture. And from the tone, you're supposed to understand that you are being insulted. I have been insulted in French, Russian, and Spanish, as well as, I'm pretty sure, Farsi, Turkish, Arabic and Vietnamese and probably some other languages, alternatively workplace bullies insult you in a foreign accent. I have been called El Stupido and Idiot, which I guess was supposed to be Russian, like the Dostoevsky novel, I'm not sure. Ridicule in the workplace goes way beyond teasing or ribbing. It's not playful, it's malicious. It's also totally not funny. Most of the time ridicule takes the form of this sort of tittering soundtrack of canned laughter that follows you everywhere you go throughout your day, throughout the workplace. Everything you do, everything you say, every move and sound you make, even just your physical presence alone is apparently the funniest thing since Chris Rock. Alternatively, ridicule takes the form of this whole thigh slapping, foot stomping, hooting and hollering hoedown. You are the workplace clown, the laughing stock of the workplace, even when you are not trying to be funny. I have been ridiculed more times than I can count for drinking coffee or water because as you know, I am the only human being in the history of civilization to drink coffee or water. Any personal information that you voluntarily disclose will be viciously pilloried ad nauseum. I have shared before on this channel how I was ridiculed for revealing that I had had eating disorders or for simply stating that I was hungry. Workplace bullies repeat everything you say in a mocking tone, apparently intended to make fun of people with special needs and with a limp wrist, apparently intended to make fun of members of the LGBTQIA community. Some workplace bullies like to ensnare you in a pseudo conversation on false pretenses. So another workplace bully can stand out of your line of vision and ridicule you by making funny faces. Some workplace bullies like to solicit responses from you for the express purpose of then ridiculing your response, like asking you how you are doing and then exploding in this whole spectacular meltdown of giggling, 
snickering and snorting because the word fine was the funniest thing they ever heard in their lives and workplace bullies especially like to ridicule you when you are sick. I have been ridiculed for coughing and for simply sniffing, which would be breathing when you are sick in a workplace bullying environment. It turns into this whole orchestrated public campaign to body shame you with dramatic grasping for tissues, slathering of hand sanitizer in your line of vision, and waving wipes and hand sanitizer in your face. Integral to the definition of the word bullying is the word harassment. So we can argue that all workplace bullying is harassment. Harassment, like the word abuse, and even the word narcissism is so overused at this point that it has no meaning. Like, what does that even mean? My definition of harassment may not be the same as yours. However, I include harassment as a unique workplace bullying technique as a sort of catch-all umbrella term for a number of assorted repeated attention-seeking and boundary-violating behaviors that are both professionally and personally disruptive. Harassment occurs when workplace bullies refuse to take no for an answer and will not leave you alone. If you say no, even if your no is only energetic and workplace bullies continue to try to get what they want from you anyway, that's harassment. Harassment includes all of the excessive contact, all of the telephone calls, email messages, and texts, even outside of work hours, which I think should be illegal. Harassment also includes recording, video, audio, or photographs of you without your consent. Most of the time, harassment takes the form of what I call forced socialization, I include in harassment all of the invasive, violating, abusive, aggressive, rapid fire series of 20 personal questions about your marital and parental status and your sex life. Are you married? Are you getting married? Are you engaged? Do you have a boyfriend? Do you have a girlfriend? Who are you screwing? More importantly, who's screwing you? And even what is your orientation? Workplace bullies apparently do not expect answers to their questions because they will either A, completely ignore your responses or be furnish the answers themselves by interrupting you, cutting you off, shutting you up and shutting you down. For example, asking you how you are doing five times in a row in different ways without allowing you the opportunity to respond. Opposition is when workplace bullies argue and disagree with absolutely everything you say, every single word out of your mouth before you can even get it out of your mouth is met with an explosive, angry opposition that is almost violent in nature. Everything you say is wrong, nothing you say is right. You could say the sky is blue and oppositional workplace bullies would scream, no it's not, it's green. Workplace bullies like to bait you with information to elicit your response and then move the goalposts so that they can disagree with their original statement, like saying the weather is nice today, and then when you agree with them, saying, nah, it's actually bad. Sometimes opposition is work-related. Oppositional workplace bullies love to shoot down your ideas, especially your creative ideas, before they even have a chance to get off the ground. However, when workplace bullies then steal your ideas and pass them off as their own, I classify that under the workplace bullying technique of extortion. Opposition is usually not a one-off. It can be. Most of the time, I find it is just this chronic, repetitive habit of, again, arguing, disagreeing, and violently opposing absolutely everything you say, even when it's not work-related. It's just casual conversation. It's just a knee-jerk autopilot reaction.
Objectification is a workplace bullying technique whereby workplace bullies reduce you to your physical body alone to the exclusion of your humanity, your ideas, your thoughts, and your feelings. Like a lot of workplace bullying techniques, objectification is repeated. It's just this chronic, nonstop, running commentary about every single inch of your physical body up to and including apparently even the sexual parts of your body. It's all about your hair, your clothes, what you're wearing, your weight, your figure, your accessories, your bag, your jewelry, your shoes. It's all about what you have. It is, to borrow from Tyra Banks, H to T, head to toe, objectification. Workplace bullies have commented on every single inch of my physical body from the size of my eyebrows to the length of my toes. I'm not kidding, and even my chest and butt. And when workplace bullies harass you with unprofessional and totally inappropriate personal questions about your marital and parental status, your sex life, and your orientation, they are indirectly commenting on the sexual parts of your body. Why is objectification bullying? What's wrong with it? Doesn't everybody objectify? I understand that people, especially women, give passing compliments from time to time about one another's appearances, but this is why I say that a lot of workplace bullying behaviors can be interpreted subjectively and everything is energy and intent. Here's the difference. When a non-bully, non-narcissist, and decent, sane, normal human being pays you a compliment, it will land. It feels genuine. It doesn't feel like a compliment, just a statement of fact. And after it, the subject is closed and you never hear about it again. Also, non-narcissists and non-bullies who pay you compliments will simultaneously respect your humanity, your ideas, your thoughts, and your feelings. And if you assert a boundary with them and ask them to stop objectifying you, they will respectfully and humbly accept that boundary. Objectification in the workplace is not a one-off. It's harassment. It is a chronic, repetitive habit that is so deeply ingrained in a person's character that it gets to the point that you absolutely cannot stand to be in the same room with this person. Workplace bullies who objectify you will at the same time completely dehumanize you by refusing to listen to your ideas, your thoughts, or your feelings, by interrupting you, cutting you off, shutting you up, and shutting you down. And if you dare to assert a boundary with them, it's World War III. Nose holding is a term that I coined for an array of assorted behaviors that workplace bullies use to intimate that the target smells bad, that you have BO, halitosis, or some other odor. Nose holding behaviors range from crinkling the nose a la bewitched, to waving the hand in front of the face, to lightly brushing or flicking the tip of the nose, to crushing the nose with the fist, to actually holding the nose by pinching the cartilage, to wrapping one hand around the entire lower half of the face, often accompanied by an expression of horror, all the way to this over-the-top, dramatic, freak-out dance of violent snorting, twitching, and animal noises. But by nose holding, I mean not just literally holding the nose, but also anything that workplace bullies do to suggest that you smell bad. For example, workplace bullies may offer you a variety of hygiene products and PPE, ranging from paper towels, tissues, wipes, and hand sanitizer, and soap, deodorant, cologne, perfume, body spray, body wash for your BO, or gum, mints, water, toothpaste, etc., for your bad breath, or they may leave those items in your workspace. Alternatively, workplace bullies like to violently spray air freshener around you or your workspace or outside of the bathroom immediately after you have used it to suggest to both sexes that you stank up the place. And of course, workplace bullies use a lot of mind games to suggest that you smell bad about 
a friend, someone or somebody, these people, some other indeterminate group of people who smell bad, need to take a shower, or what's that smell, etc. And finally, workplace bullies use mind games to insult anything that you use to smell good, your deodorant, cologne, perfume, body spray, to suggest that it smells bad, so you can't win. Staring is another workplace bullying behavior that can be interpreted subjectively, and again, it's all about intent. People stare for different reasons, some of them benign. Some people are lost in thought and don't realize they're staring at you. Some people stare at you because they find you exceptionally beautiful or unusual. You're dressed strangely or there's something else about you that makes you an anomaly. Some people stare at you because you look familiar, like someone they know. Some people stare because they're trying hard to understand you. Again, you're different. And some people stare at you because they are afraid of you. Something about you, your presence, your energy has triggered a pre-existing fear in them and they are afraid you're going to hurt them. Staring is bullying when it makes you uncomfortable. It's usually this really prolonged, sexualized, scorpionic gaze. When a Scorpio likes you, they do this staring thing. Workplace bullies actually go out of their way to invent opportunities to stare at you. In that sense, they can be quite psychic. It's like they have a sixth sense for when you arrive in the workplace and they all start crawling out of the woodwork like the maggots that they really are appearing around corners, slithering past your workspace, and making up bogus errands on false pretenses to stare at you, or just standing there staring at you while you are working or doing anything else, especially eating. There are basically two kinds of dirty looks in the workplace. The first is when workplace bullies look at you in a negative way. This is the now infamous side eye or stank eye, a contemptuous glance of hostility or whatever negativity workplace bullies want to throw your way when you greet them, pass them, or ask them a question. Most of the time, this dirty look will be directed not at your eyes, but at some part of your body usually the most sexual parts of your body, especially if you are a woman. Dirty looks include the good old H to T, head to toe, once over full body scan. This usually happens the first time you meet the workplace bully. The other kind of dirty look, and the one that I think is more damaging, is the dirty looks that workplace bullies exchange with one another about you in response to something you said, something you did, or sometimes just your physical presence alone. In this respect, dirty looks is a lot like the workplace bullying technique of ridicule, just this knee-jerk autopilot reaction to everything you do, everything you say, every move and sound you make. Workplace bullies just sit there and stare at each other when you speak or sometimes just your existence is enough to send dirty looks flying around all over the workplace. In this sense, workplace bullies are amazingly psychic. Apparently, they have the ability to communicate telepathically with one another. Snubbing is a workplace bullying technique that I coined for the now infamous narcissistic silent treatment or stonewalling. The silent treatment is one way in which narcissists abuse their victims. Some people see a difference between the silent treatment and stonewalling. I really don't. The silent treatment is exactly as it sounds. The narcissist straight up refuses to speak to you even when you are in the same room and it's not because the narcissist is hard of hearing or does not speak your language. It is a kind of willful ignoring. The narcissist really needs you to know that you are being ignored. Snubbing in the workplace is when 
workplace bullies do not greet you, answer your questions, or respond to you when you speak to them. Workplace bullies may refuse to speak to you orally, but may communicate with you electronically instead, again, even when you are in the same room, or they may refuse to respond to email messages, telephone calls, and text messages, and snubbing in the workplace manifests in really mature behaviors, like speaking to you through a third party when you are all in the same room together. Jonathan, please tell Mary that the meeting is at two. Workplace bullies may give you the literal cold shoulder by physically turning away from you in order to reinforce the message that they are deliberately snubbing you, walking in front of you and refusing to engage with you and contorting their bodies into awkward positions that actually appear quite painful in order to go out of their way to avoid interacting with you. In group situations like meetings and meals, workplace bullies will make a beeline for the other end of the table or the opposite corner of the room in order to get as far away from you as possible because, you know, you just smell so bad. Snubbing is a workplace bullying behavior that is usually conducted in private. Workplace bullies snub you in private and then make a point of accosting you with over the top, in your face, demonstrative displays of emotion in public, in front of other people, especially the higher ups they're trying to impress. But snubbing is not just stonewalling or the silent treatment. It also takes the form of ostracism, exclusion, and isolation. In a work-related sense, you may be shut out of meetings, email messages, and or projects in which you should ordinarily be included. However, if you are held responsible for the content of those interactions, I classify that under the workplace bullying technique of withholding most of the time snubbing is obviously social you are not invited to go to lunches drinks meals or other events everyone in the entire workplace is invited to go out to lunch or asked for their lunch order for pickup or delivery except you when you do go out to lunch with these people again they go out of their way to sit as far away from you as possible and or refuse to speak to you throughout the meal. The final point I wanna make about snubbing in the workplace is that the workplace bullies who snub you will very obviously engage with other employees in order to reinforce the message that you are being targeted. Years ago, when I wrote my essay on workplace bullying, I included a workplace bullying technique that I called extortion, largely as tongue-in-cheek. It was in response to one of the worst bullies I ever worked with who solicited from me a monetary donation for this bogus drive. She said she had organized ostensibly to purchase a gift for our boss. I naively went along and handed her cash only to learn within days that she had bullied me out of my position after a months long arduous smear campaign so I effectively paid someone to bully me. To this day I'm not sure whether she ever actually bought a gift for our boss or just took my money. In the intervening years I've come to the conclusion that extortion is actually a pretty apt term for all the ways in which workplace bullies steal from you because they do. The first thing workplace bullies are going to steal from you is your time overworking you, especially if you are salaried, too much work, long hours, nights, weekends, all of the excessive communication, email messages, telephone calls, text messages, outside of work hours at night and on weekends, which I think should be illegal. You know these guys who are married to their jobs, chained to their laptops, answering email messages the first thing in the morning and the last thing at night, going into the office on Saturdays and Sundays. 
Another thing that workplace bullies steal is your ideas, especially your creative ideas. They are not creative. Workplace bullies will very publicly disparage your ideas with a lot of ridicule and opposition and then turn around and pass off your ideas as their own. Finally, when workplace bullies are really sick, they straight up steal your stuff, especially your food. Over the years, I've lost a necklace, a sweatshirt, and some food. When I wrote my essay on workplace bullying, I did not include black magic as a workplace bullying technique because to my knowledge, I had not experienced it in the workplace. People had attempted spell work against me in my personal life since I was a child. However, four years ago, when I was a tutor at a tutoring center, the administrative assistant who was having sex with the regional director who was stealing money from the company, even though he was married, in order to advance herself to positions within the organization for which she was completely unqualified, was doing spell work against me and my coworkers. I now include black magic as kind of a subset of the workplace bullying technique of extortion because workplace bullies literally steal your stuff for use in spell work. How do you know a workplace bully is doing black magic against you? One sign is that stuff goes missing. There's an obvious kleptomaniac inside your workplace. If a workplace bully ever asks to borrow anything from you, clothing or sanitary items, consider that a major red flag. When workplace bullies are really bold, they may attempt to curse you with the workplace bullying technique of muttering under the breath, which is a form of the workplace bullying technique of insults, mouthing inaudibly in your face. The workplace bully may just be insulting you or may be cursing you. Workplace bullies may also attempt to curse you with their hands. Another sign is the physical symptoms. The big one is gastrointestinal distress. If you wake up at 3 a.m. and you're on the toilet for four hours, sweating buckets and turning green, that's a psychic attack. These people like to work at night in secret in the dark. You may think that it's food poisoning, but it could be that you ingested something, either your food or theirs, that the bully cursed or that the bully is actually doing spell work against you at that time. You may also wake up with a crushing sensation, like you're going to suffocate to death. That may be a demon that the workplace bully is trying to send your way. Other physical symptoms include weird health problems that you never had before. When I was working at the tutoring center, I broke out in hives on my face which had never happened to me before. The administrative assistant clearly had a problem with what I looked like and was trying to attack me for it. And I got a migraine for the first time in my life. At home, you may detect foul odors that come out of nowhere that you cannot trace to any detectable source. You may find that your relationships with loved ones, family members, and friends become strained. You may lose interest in hobbies or other things that once gave you joy. That is the workplace bully attempting to destroy the good things that you have in your life. If you have a pet, you may notice that your pet becomes unusually stressed or sick. Animals are part of the spirit world and they are even more sensitive to energy than we are. Another sign is that all of the above is happening to your coworkers who may report their own strange symptoms. Having to pull over to the side of the road to vomit, coming into work late, having to leave work early, absenteeism and tardiness due to illness. The workplace bully may successfully be able to get rid of some people and you may witness some people disappearing under mysterious circumstances for some reason they just don't work there anymore. When I was working at the tutoring center, one of my coworkers couldn't get her visa renewed. The administrative assistant definitely 
had something to do with that. You may also witness coworkers behaving out of character and making very bad choices like having extramarital affairs, a sure sign that love spells have been attempted. The verb withhold in English means to not give. It's basically an antonym for give. Withholding in the workplace is when you are not given the information, knowledge, materials, tools, or resources necessary to do the job in the first place. However, you are still held responsible for doing the work without ever being given what you need to do it. There are two types of withholding, physical and intellectual. So let's just start with the physical equipment, supplies, materials. This could be office equipment, especially electronic equipment. For example, once I was hired as a journalist by a newspaper but never given a phone. Or even basic office supplies like paper and pens. Alternatively, withholding is very common in education. You are never given any books, materials, or even adequate access to technology in the classroom or even any curriculum information about the students or their levels or course objective. Withholding is also access, blocking access to equipment, printer, fax machine, copier, or areas around the workplace like storage rooms. For example, most of the time withholding is work-related. Sometimes it's personal blocking access to items and areas in the workplace like the kitchen or the bathroom, for example. Most of the time withholding is intellectual, it's information, knowledge. Workplace bullies are information hoarders, they're siloed. There is no knowledge sharing in a workplace bullying environment. The first information that workplace bullies are going to withhold from you is the job. This job is just not what you thought it was going to be. It's like you signed the paperwork during a mercury retrograde. Either these uncreative people cannot come up with anything for you to actually do, or you are assigned duties that were nowhere in the job ad or the job description and never discussed at any point during the interview process. Often these duties are insulting and beneath your level of education and experience. For example, when I was in my 20s and halfway toward my master's degree, I got a job as a proofreader for a major downtown law firm and was told to go pick up everyone's lunch. I'm not an attorney, but to my knowledge, this is actually not illegal. In fact, I think that employers deliberately pad job ads and job descriptions with vague verbiage like and other duties as assigned in order to get away with this kind of exploitation. You are not given any training or the training you do get is inadequate or maybe even incorrect. And then there is the now infamous shutting you out of meetings and email messages, which is snubbing, but becomes withholding when you are held responsible for the content of those interactions. If withholding is when workplace bullies do not give you what you need to do the job in the first place, and opposition is when your work cannot even get off the ground, sabotage is when workplace bullies destroy your work after you have already created it. But in order to understand sabotage, there needs to be a distinction between two types of work, goods and services. For example, if you work in a factory manufacturing widgets and I want to sabotage you, all I have to do is destroy your widgets. Sabotage is very common in workplaces that make use of some kind of file sharing system, Google Drive, a common drive, Dropbox, the cloud, whatever. All the workplace bully has to do is go in there and with a few clicks of a mouse, destroy all of your work. Some sabotage in the workplace takes the form of undoing, reversing your work, dirtying something you cleaned, disorganizing something you organized, erasing and deleting something you created. 
However, in America at least, we are increasingly living in what is called a service economy. That's a fancy way of saying we don't make anything anymore. Our manufacturing base has been decimated. More and more people are working in low skill, low wage, public facing professions where personality matters more than actual productivity. If you work with clients, these could be patients, students, custies, or some other type of client in a service profession, it's difficult to sabotage the service you are providing. So workplace bullies are going to try to sabotage your relationships, especially your relationships with your clients. They may just steal your clients or try to withhold your clients from you in some other way. And of course, workplace bullies are going to try to sabotage your relationships with your clients by smearing you to them with the workplace bullying technique of gossip. This is the big one. Gossip is the grease that lubricates the whole machine. But if we loosely define gossip as talking about people who are not present, then doesn't everyone gossip? Gossip is bullying when the intent is wholly malicious. Gossip is a weapon that workplace bullies use to smear, slander, and defame. They are snakes in the grass with silver tongues. This is the narcissistic smear campaign. But again, if gossip is by definition something that takes place when you're not there, how do you know people gossip about you? They let you know. Workplace bullies have many ways of letting you know that they have been gossiping about you, including all the dirty looks they exchange with one another in response to something you say, something you do, or just your physical presence alone, letting you know that they are mutually recalling something that they have already gossiped about or that they plan to gossip about later. And then there is the now infamous comedy scene when you accidentally interrupt the gossip and everyone in the room clears their throats and shifts uncomfortably and the whole room falls into an awkward silence or the minute you exit the room everything gets quiet because they're all whispering the content of the gossip keeps coming up in conversation workplace bullies repeat things that you thought you had disclosed in confidence to another workplace bully. Finally, people that you had thought were safe suddenly turn on you with usually the silent treatment indicating that they have been corrupted by the gossip. A lot of gossip in the workplace is on company time and company pay and at the expense of company equipment, materials, and resources. Workplace bullies set up whole email chains and social media groups for the express purpose of gossiping about you. If you are a target of workplace bullying, there is probably an email chain right now flying around among your bullies about you. Workplace bullies stand or sit for literal hours on company time and company pay to gossip. I counted as long as four hours that workplace bullies sat in one long witch fest about me. Gossip in the workplace functions a lot like the game of telephone. The problem with the gossip is that sometimes there is an element of truth to it, but it has been exaggerated, distorted, embellished, heavily filtered through the gossip grapevine. I think that workplace gossip is like cryptids. Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, werewolves, vampires, elementals, mermaids. I believe that at one time there probably were some creatures that somewhat resembled those beings, but thousands of years of the oral tradition have so corrupted the truth that the original reality is no longer recognizable. If you are a victim of workplace gossip, that's what you are. You're a cryptid. Stalking in the workplace goes way beyond the normal casual curiosity employees 
experience about new additions to the workplace. It is a psychotic obsession that borders on criminality. In the workplace, stalking is going to start with the eavesdropping. Workplace bullies are master eavesdroppers, just hanging on your every word. They may go so far as to move offices, furniture, and equipment, the better to eavesdrop on you with. For example, when I was a teacher at a school, my biggest bully in the place requested that her class be moved downstairs next to mine, placed a chair outside my classroom door, and abandoned her class so that she could sit listening to mine. In another example, when I worked at a technical writing agency, my narcissistic boss placed a pencil sharpener behind me so she had an excuse to periodically check to see what was on my computer screen throughout the day. I did not know that it was humanly possible to sharpen one pencil that many times in one day. Just for the record, we didn't use pencils at that technical writing agency. Stalking also includes all of the single white female copycat imitation, dressing like you, buying your clothes, doing their hair and makeup like you, imitating your mannerisms, etc. Workplace bullies start following you around the workplace. They follow you to and from your car. And when they start following you outside the workplace, that's when it gets scary. If you think workplace bullies are stalking your social media, they are. In fact, that's the first thing they do the minute they meet you, race to their computers to start stalking your socials, and they use company time, pay, and equipment to do it. Workplace bullies follow you to your car and then follow you to figure out where you live, or they may get your address off your resume from HR and start driving past your place of residence. I once had a narcissistic boss who admitted to me that he had driven past my place of residence twice. I moved during this time because he didn't have enough empathy to understand how a single female subordinate might feel threatened by her older male boss stalking her. And when they are not content driving past your place of residence, they will invite themselves in on false pretenses. For example, they urgently need to drop something off outside of work hours when they totally don't. And then workplace bullies start showing up in your experience outside of the workplace where they know you go. Restaurants, bars, gyms, public places, places of worship, volunteering. When I lived in my hometown, I used to run in two public parks every day and I counted at least half a dozen former workplace bullies following me around the park and staring at me there, even though they admitted to me not only that they did not run, but did not exercise at all. The worst stalking is actually going to take place after you have been eliminated from the workplace. And I just want to point out that not one of the people who are psychotically, obsessively stalking you has the courage to ever approach you, sit down across from you, make eye contact, and engage with you in a healthy relationship of mutual respect, equality, and peace. Lying is sort of an extension of the workplace bullying technique of gossip. Gossip is largely contained among the subordinates. Gossip is when your lateral colleagues are all talking about you behind your back. Lying is when they present their statistically flawed findings to your boss. Most of the time, the lies are work-related. Sometimes it's about your work ethic or your character. And sometimes the lies are criminal. You are accused of breaking the law. When I worked in office environments, the lies about me were always that I was not on task, doing something not work-related, doing something personal, just wants to do her personal stuff. When I worked in schools, the lies about me 
were always a limiting and exclusionary misrepresentation of my work. I only teach grammar, I only teach test prep, I never use their books. One time I was unfriendly. How do you know that workplace bullies are lying about you? It will all be revealed. You're gonna hear about it in the form of a bad review, a written or verbal warning, or just a firing. Constructive feedback is necessary, not just in the workplace, but in all of life to motivate, encourage, and inspire everyone to evolve, change, and grow. There is no such thing as constructive feedback in a workplace bullying environment. There is only what I call unfair criticism. There are three types of unfair criticism, blowing things out of proportion, nitpicking, and making stuff up. Blowing things out of proportion is exactly as it sounds, making mountains out of molehills. It's another game of telephone, a distortion of the truth. One thing that you do one time, work-related or otherwise, suddenly becomes a pattern. Nitpicking is magnifying and overemphasizing minor trivialities that ultimately have no bearing on the work. And when push comes to shove, Workplace bullies are not at all above just making stuff up and accusing you of stuff you didn't do. One thing that workplace bullies love to do is to set their watches 20 minutes ahead of everyone else's just so they can accuse other people of being late. That is the most classic move in the workplace bullying playbook. If a workplace bully does that to you, you are dealing with someone who is as uncreative as it gets. Sometimes the lies are criminal. You are accused of breaking the law. The easiest thing for workplace bullies to accuse you of is their own mistakes. And the best time for them to smear you is after you are gone and are no longer around to defend yourself. So that's it. That's the end game. Game over. You are on your way out. Let me know what you think. Let me know how I did, anything I missed, anything you'd like to add. Of course, when it comes to workplace bullying, it's usually a case of all of the above. Slight caveat, I am worried that by articulating a definition of workplace bullying, what I have effectively done is spelled out a how-to guide, a step-by-step -step playbook for narcissists to use to hurt people in the workplace. When we tell narcissists what bothers us, we are handing them the bullets to shoot us with. If you go on a date with a narcissist and you say, well, my last partner cheated on me and that was very hurtful and I don't want that to happen again, the narcissist is just sitting there rubbing his hands together thinking, oh good, now I know how to really get you. Defining workplace bullying is a noble goal, but be careful the minute workplace bullies figure out what you don't like, they will not only not stop the behavior, they will double down on it. They will escalate. I hope that helps. Take care.